Okay, seeing a presence of a quorum, I'm going to call the meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at 6.01 p.m. Uh, just to note that this meeting is recorded and being live broadcast by Amherst Media. Thank you, Amherst Media. Uh, first order of business is to approve minutes of March 11th, 2019. So I would give the committee a moment to uh, review, which was already sent via email to you prior. But if you can take a moment to review it and uh, note any comments or edits or questions. Mr. Nakajima. I guess since I like the phrase, I'm going to edit in that in my comments after complimenting um, Ms. McDonald and Chair Ardonias for your wonderful work, um, I also noted that um, that we're seeking consensus in many ways consensus is a process instead of a destination isn't a destination it's a process Ms. Westmoreland is busily taking note <laughs> thank you Mr. Nakajima any other edits or comments from the committee if not I will take a motion Mr. Nakajima Move to approve the minutes of March 11th, 2019. Thank you. We have a mo uh, motion. Can we get a second? Second. <laughs> Ms. Spitzer, you get it. <laughs> second from Ms. Spitzer. Uh, all those in favor? Thank you very much. So we will approve those minutes with the edit noted by Mr. Nakajima. Uh, moving on to the next item on the agenda is uh, committee announcements and public comment. I don't know if the committee has any announcements they would like to make. Mr. Dumling? Uh, just a brief reminder to any parents who haven't already uh, done so that the uh, special education survey closes this Friday, available online at arps.org. So if you are one of the 20% or odd uh, parents whose uh, child is, is receiving special ed services, um, our, our wonderful array of special ed services, in the spirit of continuous improvement, we'd love to get your feedback. It, it helps us improve. and. Uh, and evolve and get better. So that ends on Friday. Great. Thank you very much. Dr. Morris? Just, the survey was actually Button. Button. Thank you. Uh, the survey is actually extended to the 29th just to encourage. We got some feedback that people wanted a little more time uh, given the busy time of year. People were away last week, some of them, um, based on the university's break calendar. So uh, it's extended to the 29th. Thank but you, Dr. Everything Morris. Everything else, I'm with you. <laughs> Um, and I'll make actually just a brief announcement that we, uh, uh, Dr. Morris and myself presented to the town council last night on, about the statement of interest uh, applications that we, um, this, this body actually approved the week prior for both Fort River and Wildwood Elementary Schools. Um, and it was a very good meeting. It was very well attended by the, by the public actually as well. Uh, we had some good questions from the council and um, looking forward to moving forward with their vote on April 1st. Okay, uh, no further comments from the committee. I'm gonna to move to public comment. If anyone is here uh, to make comment uh, tonight, please come up to the microphone. Um, you might have to press the button to turn it on, and state your name, and you've got three minutes. Come on up. Nope, just come up. There's one person standing up behind you, though. <laughs> okay. Press the button, yeah, okay. to see green light. Okay, hi. hi. Uh, my name's Laura Drocker. I am a parent of a kindergartner at Wildwood. Um, and I'm speaking a little bit out of turn because I, I wanna, I'm sort of giving a talk a little bit about the food service update. So it sounds, it seems a little awkward present, talking now before the presentation. But I just wanted to express my um, gratitude and, and admiration for the hardworking farm to school team of which I've been very lucky to be a part of. Um, I joined the group on the farm to school retreat that we took last fall that I think you got updated on um, in my capacity both as a parent but also as the sustainability director at Amherst College um, for which that work includes supporting farm to institution work um, and we have our own farm on campus and so we, we w w do a lot of the similar work of trying to get more local food into our dining facility but also figure out ways to get students out into the field, out into nature and working with the food. Um, what I've seen in my time with this team is just a whole lot of dedication and grit. Um, 
and an amazing ideas and vision of this team, um, led significantly by Jen Reese and Leela and the Garden Education and Curricular Curriculum, um, classroom teachers like Miss Lisa at Wildwood who bring the garden into their classroom um, with such excitement, and Sasha Palmer, Palmer uh, Chef Sam, and her vision and their vision to increase local food and importantly participation in the food program, which brings revenue and it can only help increase um, more local food. Um, so something that may not be as well known is uh, just the way that food is an amazing opportunity to build community and allow our diverse community in our schools to share their own cultures through food. Um, Sasha's already doing amazing things here. Um, working together in a garden is also an amazing equalizer. We see this at college all the time. We get groups of students out on the farm working together and all of a sudden they're talking and engaging in ways that they never get to do in the classroom or in any, really any other space on campus. Um, and just from my conversations with this team, I'm seeing that that's already happening in our elementary schools as well. Um, as a group, we have amazing ideas. We have some funding opportunities that will hopefully can allow us to continue to get started, but we are, I think, just getting started. So I'm looking forward to continue to working on, working together um, and hopefully garnishing the support of the district, the school committee, and the community at large to build a sustainable and fully funded school farm to school program over time. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> so just make sure you press the button there so that you can be heard. Thank you. All right. My name is Lisa Poirier. I work at Wildwood School as a kindergarten teacher. I have um, many, many years in the district, and I want to echo what Laura had to say about how exciting <coughs> the food service program is. I wish you could have seen the food years ago when the carrots were gray, and the, I used to dare the kids to eat one. Uh, now they're, they're beautiful. I mean, they, they're fresh, good, delicious food, and Sasha is really transforming our nutrition, our food nutrition program in the district. So I feel very grateful to be on the farm to school team with um, Will here, who's heading up the community piece of it. Jen Reese, our science coordinator, who's working on the curriculum. And uh, Sasha, who's working on the cafeteria part. So it's classroom, cafeteria, and community. And there are a lot of amazing ideas coming your way, hopefully soon. Um, I also want to just take a moment to say that we had a pilot at, at the elementary schools, breakfast in the classroom. And there's also something called breakfast after the bell. And that gives kids an opportunity who, if you get on the bus in Shootsbury, like my kids, we get on the bus at quarter of seven, so they're eating breakfast really early, and lunch comes pretty late. So if there was a, a grab and go, like Sasha's you know, thinking about and researching, that would help kids get the energy and the food they need to be more available to learning. So, thanks. Thank you very much. Any other public comments? Okay. Um, I have a letter that uh, was submitted by a community member um, who asked that I share this with the committee. And it's also regarding the food services program. It seems like it's a very popular topic tonight. <laughs> um, to Superintendent Dr. Morris and Food Service Director Ms. Sasha Palmer, we are asking for your help with an issue of great importance to the Amherst, Pelham, and Regional School Districts. We would like to have organic, GMO-free, clean food menus only. Organic, GMO-free, clean foods are important to all students because they help develop healthy minds and are noted for better behaved students as well. In 2013, the Sausalito Marin, Marin School District began a pilot program to make the switch to organic GMO-free food and have repeatedly documented the program's success and cost savings. The results speak for themselves, Superintendent of Sausalito Marin City Council School District is quoted as saying, since launching the pilot at Bayside MLK Academy in 2013, students are eating real food for breakfast and lunch, discipline cases have dropped dramatically, 
attendance has improved, food waste is down, and students and teachers' sharing of meals has led to improved manners and open communication, greatly enhancing the school community. Switching to this kind of food is also important for improving the health and well-being of our children. Obesity is a growing problem among American students. As many as one in five of us are already overweight, one in three young people will develop diabetes in their lifetime unless our diets and exercise patterns change. Our community has an opportunity to combat these epidemics by providing the best foods we can in our schools. Additionally, up to 50 million Americans are lactose intolerant. 90% of Asian Americans and 70% of Native Americans and people of African heritage have this normal condition. Providing vegan options like soy, rice, oat, hemp, and coconut milk will meet the needs of lactose intolerant and students allergic to dairy. Providing organic, GMO-free, and clean foods will satisfy the needs of every student every day. Finally, some members of our school community avoid eating school meals for ethical and religious reasons, as well as individual taste preferences. Many more are skipping meats and dairy-based foods for environmental and animal wel welfare reasons. An organic, GMO-free, plant-based menu will eliminate these concerns and allow all students to be fed properly. I and members of the Region School Equity Task Force ask you to please work with our school committees, food services staff, and finance director to ensure the funds to purchase helpful organic GMO-free food and beverages. A helpful resource for more information is healthyschoollunches.org. Similarly, the Conscious Kitchen, Judy Schills, can help make the transition to serving our children the best food an easy task. The Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is a national organization that will work with you for free. PCRM has helped schools around the country and can help us by providing free professional advice and finding distributors, recipes, techniques, and much more to reach the goal of becoming the second school district in the U.S. to go completely organic and GMO-free. Thank you for your attention. Mary Lou Conca, um, and she states on behalf of our School Equity Task Force, although I do want to make a note that the School Equity Task Force is a subcommittee of the Regional School Committee uh, and has not actually endorsed this, and plus this is the Amherst School Committee, as this body already knows, so we do not typically uh, endorse um, something that's been endorsed by that subcommittee. Okay, uh, with that, um, I'm going to move us to the superintendent's update. Dr. Morris? Sure. So um, I'll be brief. I'm sorry, it's oral. It's not in. Uh, it's not written tonight. Um, so tomorrow, and I'm un unfortunately unable to attend, but uh, Representative McGovern was invited by a Clark Farm first grader to come and talk about something that Clark Farm first grader really wanted to have um, be heard and worked with his family to reach out. And to everyone's surprise, uh, Representative McGovern said, "Sure, I'd love to come." So. We'll be there, I think, between 12 and 1 tomorrow, both meeting with that first grade student as well as touring the school. So we're very appreciative of our representatives, in this case U.S. representatives, uh, showing a strong interest in education and particularly our public schools. Um, as a follow-up um, to the ADA audit presentation that we talked about in this room, actually, uh, we've had, uh, we, we had some weather-related issues with some of the meetings, but we've had three meetings uh, for the public as well as administrative staff with the consultants from KMA to start prioritizing um, different items. And what they are working on is uh, two, twofold. One is a prioritization, but also uh, a color-coded um, categorization of items that can be done by our facilities staff if given time. Um, things like replacing signs. You know, we'll have to purchase signs, but that doesn't require any kind of deep um, contract with a consultant to do uh, things that are, you know, reason uh, more moderately priced things that would involve uh, a contractor to help with, and then things that are big ticket items financially that certainly would. And so they're both working on a prioritization, but also the categorization, which you know we're seeing, we've seen some early drafts and offered feedback on, and I found already really helpful um, to look through. So uh, we'd like to bring that back at the April meeting uh, for, for more discussion uh, with you all. Uh, but I want to thank members of the public for coming, um, as well as our staff members. Um, to talk about the lived experience in schools and particularly want to thank the principals who came and were able to describe um, for many families and many students what you know they hear on a regular basis around access. Um, uh, two things related to uh, kindergarten. So kindergarten registration starts tomorrow. So it's from 8 to 2, the next three, more, three days, I should say, um, at the middle school at central office. And then um, also, uh, See, Tuesday, so it's Thursday night from 6 to 7, uh, also in the same space. Um, we also had a kindergarten registration event, see, about two weeks ago. Um, yeah, two, two weeks ago yesterday uh, at Fort Rivers Library, and uh, it was a great event. We had a lot of, 
a lot of families, a lot of students. Um, so it was like really felt like kindergarten. Uh, it was great, uh, and a wide mix of wide mix of uh, can, future kindergartners who wanted to be right with their parents, which makes sense, and those that were pretty happy exploring the studio space, as they say, of the large Fort River Library. So uh, it was a great event, and want to thank everyone who worked to put it on, and thank actually. Well, it's a nice segue in a minute to the food service who. Uh, catered the event and had uh, really nice nutritious treats for everybody who was there, so thank you very much. Um, we're also holding events uh, more specifically around the dual language program, which was part of our event, uh, in um, several places around town uh, where uh, it's more likely that families have ex expressed to us that transportation challenges exist for themselves uh, within apartment um, settings. So uh, we've started those and that'll continue over the next week or two. Um, Today, yep. Yeah. So the last thing I think I want to share, other things were, were already expressed by the um, committee members. Um, today, I was uh, the commissioner of education hosted uh, an event. This is the first time a commissioner has done something like this called Kairos, which is Greek. Uh, so um, the idea is that it's an opportune time and place, and uh, really trying to think about the future of education in Massachusetts. So there was this large group, you know, I was at UMass, which was super convenient for me, uh, less convenient as I heard grumbles from folks in the 495 uh, and East area. Um, but um, it was really focused on, we've gotten as far as we can get in the standards movement, what's next? Um, and how do we promote engaging instruction and how would that affect assessment? And it was, it was a really successful day, I think, in many ways uh, for the community. There was um, state board members there, superintendents, um, and um, non-for-profit folks, folks who are in the kind of um, unofficial K-12 world, so to speak. Uh, were also present, so um, just it was a really nice event. I don't have a lot of take-homes more than that, um, but it was really nice to hear the commissioner describe what he envisions the future. Because when we talk, and you'll hear a little bit from Crocker Farm and Wildwood later about project-based learning and student engagement being at the forefront, I heard that from the commissioner this morning. So I think it'll segue well when we get to the strategic planning work that's happening in our schools. And I think the other ones I had on my list were already discussed. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Do, are there any questions or comments for Dr. Morris on the superintendent's update? Okay, thank you. Uh, before we get too much farther along on the, the agenda, I just wanted to make a note for the committee. Um, we have on the agenda for tonight school committee meeting format, which is a topic that had come up previously. Um, we actually have not had uh, a chance, Dr. Morris and I and our vice chair, to connect on this topic, so I would like to table this if we can for our next meeting. Thank you, I see nodding heads. So this will be tabled for our very next meeting of the Amherst School Committee. <laughs> okay, uh, next item is a food services update, which is very exciting. Um, <laughs> I have to say, as soon as I walked into the room, I noticed the food over here, so I'm hoping at some point the food is also going to make an appearance. <laughs> Dr. Morris, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I do. So I, I think a couple things um, that I want to share is I know this group's worked hard to narrow uh, the presentation down to 15 minutes, and I'm going to queue based on Ms. Palmer's um, recommendation. I'll queue at five minutes and one minute because we're trying to, we could go on forever, as I could, even in this introduction, about the work that's going on in food services. So. Um, Thank you. I appreciate the yeah. opportunity to stay on the agenda time. <laughs> uh, but, but I'll use one minute that's not part of your 15 <laughs> to the group. Uh, just to note that um, what was spoken in public comment earlier is what I experienced as well firsthand. Um, so when we have events, when we have visitors in, we were really accustomed to farming that out um, to local vendors. And what we've been able to do is that in addition to the traditional food service, the, the catering part and the work that, you know, Ms. Malcolm, who's here, uh, and Ms. Palmer have done this year has been tremendous uh, and well appreciated. We had a RIAC meeting, which is, you know, I've spoken about before, and we hosted the first one the fall, and they were blown away by uh, the food service department. They, they assumed it was, you know, some vendor in the area. Um, and it was like, no, that, that was us. Um, and personally, I, as, Ms. Palmer knows I eat school lunch multiple times a week, and I frankly didn't used to do that. Um, and so I really appreciate all the hard work and the improvement that we've seen and the continued hard work, um, this dedication to the future. And I appreciate you bringing food and smoothies for us tonight. So I want to note that as well as someone who hasn't eaten much dinner yet, I'm deeply, deeply appreciative. But with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to the team. All right, thank you so much for having, a, having us. It was such a pleasure 
bringing food to you. These items we actually um, sampled at our um, Breakfast in the Classroom pilot program that Chef Sam made. We have today um, Rosemary from Project Bread, and she'll talk to you some more about uh, Breakfast in the Classroom and what it, it, it looks like, why we're doing this, and our resident Chef Sam, who, <laughs> who once you walk across the district, you'll hear kids talking about Chef Sam. Um, so 2018-2019 school year started off with us having a summer food rock tour with Congressman um, Jim McGovern. And um, that tour was to bring awareness to the summer program that we have. We expanded the summer program um, in 2018, 2019, and is looking towards doing the same this, um, this coming summer. Uh, there are a number of things that is happening in our school district. We hosted the fair, we launched our new website and if you have kids in the elementary school you had an experience to please go to amherstfood.com and browse our website we have a farm to school page which we're working on and i know i don't have enough time or a lot of time but just a quick our website is um focused on giving we we developed an interactive menu because we want to give parents, and especially elementary parents, and um, more control over what their kids eat, or more information about what is in school meal. So kids can, um, parents can view or browse the nutrition information. Once you go on the website, you can see, for those people who are counting calories, can also count the calories. But the cool part of it is for kids with um, special meal accommodation, we, they are able to identify and eliminate those items that have any one of the eight major allergens. I've done a lot of the allergens, but not all. <laughs> so for example, if a kid has a parent with a child that is gluten-free, they can go in, select the menu, and eliminate mm. those items that are, have gluten. And the same for um, some of the unconventional um, ones like pork or, <laughs> or so on. And it's available at amherstfood.com. Also, it is available as a mobile app, so you can take it wherever you go. Our parents can, can take that wherever they go. We hope that um, people are using it because it's not just um, a website, it has a lot of uh, information that, nutrition information that parents can use. So to, we, we have been partnering with Project Bread since um, before I came, the year before I came, and we've, <laughs> we are continuing that. Project Bread is, um, has a number of programs that um, they have sponsored. We, we have Rosemary, who was very instrumental in helping us to pilot breakfast in the classroom. And she'll, she'll talk a little about what it is and where we're looking to go in um, the next school year. And Chef Sam, who does our taste testing. All the kids in, in Amherst um, School District know Chef Sam, and we, we have seen the value of having Chef Sam in schools because on those days when we are piloting those um, food or those menu items that Chef Sam create or those recipes, we have seen an increase in participation. And I'll turn it over to Chef Sam to quickly. Great, thank you. Thanks, Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Eichlin, uh, Chef Sam, as the kids that the kids are saying these days. Uh, I'm the director of the Chefs and Schools program at Project Bread and have been working with Amherst Schools since 2017. Um, I'm in the district two days a week and I work on a rotation through the schools. They last uh, about five to six weeks per school. Uh, so it's a two-part program. We're providing training to the staff through these recipes that are selected uh, Sasha and myself select them, uh, or we work to develop them. They're, they're 
fresh. They incorporate scratch cooking techniques, uh, more fresh fruits and vegetables in the dishes. They're also culturally relevant uh, and culturally appropriate to the student body. And, and those recipes serve as a teaching framework for the staff, so we work on the recipes. And then any skills within the recipes that um, you know, we can work on or develop, we will. Uh, we'll learn about new ingredients that may be unfamiliar or, or less common in the school meal program. And then on that first day, I take the recipe, the samples out into the cafeteria, and the kids really love it. I mean, if, if I invite you all to come and see a sample day one of these days, because the kids get very excited, especially at the elementary level. Um, the middle school and high school kids are excited too. They just do it their own way. Uh, you know, but you know, I set up a table in the cafeteria with a tablecloth and I wear a chef's coat and offer the kids samples and they get to give me feedback through whatever age appropriate means. Sometimes I give them paper surveys, other times they're just little sticker charts. But the kids get really excited about the opportunity to share their thoughts. Uh, and then we use those, that, that feedback and the thoughts from the kids um, to either alter the recipes or, uh, or just run them as they are on the menu at that second visit. So then the kids have now had this opportunity to try it, the staff have the training, and then on that second day, this is when, what Sasha's referring to, where we see that the participation does increase around these meals that the kids have had a lot of opportunity to uh, express their opinions and have buy-in. Uh, this is a rough sketch of the upcoming rotation. Uh, I have not made it to Wildwood just yet, but that's starting next week, and then I'll be there for a few weeks with Wildwood, Fort River, and Crocker Farm to round out the year. And I know that this isn't exactly in this school committee, but I did manage to get to Pelham this year for the first time, which was really wonderful because we did not have the opportunity to do that last year. So I've been in, in all the schools and Summit Academy as well. Um, yeah. That's... Upcoming. Oh, right. And we've got, so the taste testing at the elementaries, and then... Um, we're doing something at the uh, Healthy Kids Healthy Program Summit that's organized by DESI coming up in May, which is a partnership with Mass Farm to School and Project Bread. And we're doing a culinary uh, like throwdown, basically, where three districts are participating, and they're going to bring their best farm to school side dishes and cook them for the audience and sample them. And we've got a team coming uh, from Crocker Farm, which is really exciting. So we're still selecting their <laughs> recipe. And then this summer, uh, I'll be spending some time in the district working on um, breakfast recipe development and hopefully recipes, developing recipes that are going to work well in this model of either breakfast after the bell or breakfast in the classroom, which I think is probably Rosemary's cue. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, yep. Thank you for the introduction. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yes. So good evening. Um, as Sasha mentioned, my name is Rosemary Kayward. And I am the Senior Outreach Coordinator for the Child Nutrition Outreach Program at Project Bread. Um, so I began working with the district um, two years ago um, to explore introducing an, an alternative breakfast model. Um, and it's really taken shape um, with Sasha here within the last few months. Um, so in recognizing that um, every student should have the opportunity to start their school day with a nutritious breakfast, um, the food service department, um, looking at the participation data across the district, recognized that many students are missing breakfast. And we know this true um, across the nation, really, in that breakfast in the cafeteria is hard to get to when you have um, limited time in the morning or arriving just before you have to get to the classroom. So in many ways, traditional cafeteria breakfast just doesn't work. Um, so breakfast in the classroom is one of three after-the-bell breakfast models that's been proven to increase participation. Um, it makes it part of the day, like school lunch. It makes it part of the day, part of the schedule, um, and really normalize it. it. removes all the barriers that traditional cafeteria um, breakfast presents. Um, so breakfast in the classroom is essentially um, after the instructional bell rings, breakfast will have already been delivered to the classroom. And for the 15 minutes, roughly, um, students will start their day eating breakfast with some kind of facilitated learning with the teacher. Um, and just to note, back in 2015, the commissioner of the late commissioner of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education put out a policy guidance recognizing that um, the connection between eating breakfast and um, improved learning health and behavior for, for students. 
Um, so that he recognizes in probiotic policy guidance showing this that, yes, we want to count the first 15 minutes of instructional time and allow kids to eat breakfast in the classroom. Um, so for the past few months, I've been working with Sasha and Georgia yeah. to introduce breakfast in the classroom um, to the elementary schools. The elementary schools were identified as um, the easiest way to introduce this model to the district. So we set up... We piloted the breakfast um, program, the breakfast in the classroom program throughout the week of National School Breakfast Week. We thought that that week would be a week where we can bring so much awareness to um, breakfast in the classroom. We piloted um, at Fort River, all the classes at Fort River, and we had representative coming in. We had um, Mike in his element reading to the kids and um, <laughs> the representative Mindy Dom um, also participated. We, we saw a marked improvement or increase in participation over that pilot, um, pilot week. We, it, compared to the week before when it was breakfast in the cafeteria, we saw maybe a 45% um, percent increase in participation across most or all of the, um, the, the status free, reduced, and paid. So we see why this um, breakfast in the classroom is very important. We have what we're looking into, the universal breakfast program that we're um, trying to, and when we do have some time, we want to sit, back, sit down and um, iron out and show the district what, it, what, what that would mean, breakfast, um, the universal, universally free breakfast program. And as Chef Sam mentioned, we did receive a grant from Project Bread, and that is to improve the quality of the breakfast items that we are serving. So we are planning to incorporate the farm to school program utilizing locally grown fresh um, food items or fresh products into our breakfast program as well as into the, the lunch program. Uh, the farm to school, we have started our farm to school work and a number of our Farm to School team leaders are here. We have Jennifer Reese, we have Will. We've partnered with UMass, uh, Amherst College, uh, Smith College. One of our team leaders is from each of those um, universities, and we think that that partnership has been great in the work that we are doing and we plan on um, doing moving forward. We, we are in the process of um, coming up with our action plan for the USDA grant that we received uh, last year. And, and um, we were also invited to participate in the Mass Farm to Institute, which we are one of eight schools that was asked to go to a retreat in coming up with a plan, an action plan, and the opportunity to apply for um, grant funding through the Henry P. Kendall Foundation grant. We form three teams, the curriculum, cafeteria, and community team. We think that um, the farm to school should encompass everyone. It is a community. Um, we believe that education, um, the food that we eat, and the community should be involved in um, food service. We will continue to um, a number of, and, and while we're all new to, the district is new to, farm to school, we're looking to, we have a number of people reaching out to us because they see the work that we have been doing. Thanks to our team, our teams, we are invited to uh, participate and, and present at the New England Farm to Institute Summit at UMass, that will be on April 2019. We are in the process of applying for uh, the, the, the Kendall Grant, which we're looking towards funding of almost $100,000. Hopefully we, the team is working very hard, so we're, <laughs> we're hoping that uh, we can come up with some, a number or figure close to, to, to that. And also just continue the work that we are doing with our USDA grant in um, developing a plan that will build a sustainable um, food program because we believe that um, farm to school is the backbone of the, the food service program and, and moving forward. 
I just want to say thanks to everybody. I know our team teams have been <laughs> working hard. I see them at six, seven, six o'clock at night, leaving their team meetings. All the team volunteers. We still have. Um, we still are, are seeking volunteers, student volunteers, to be a part of um, one of those teams. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Palmer, and, and to all of you, thank you so much for taking the time to come tonight. Um, this has been a program that we have all been very excited about for quite some time, and it's wonderful to get these updates and to hear more about what you're up to, especially when you have such innovative programs like the you know breakfast in the classroom, uh, but just all of the work that you're doing with local communities, farming communities, and you know, and with uh, the the schools themselves. Um, I'm just going to turn over to the, the committee now to see if there's any questions or comments for our presenters or for Dr. Morris tonight on this topic. Ms. Spitzer? Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much. I really appreciate learning about this, um, the work you're doing, and I'm continually impressed. I haven't even tasted the food yet, um, but I'm sure I will continue to be impressed after that. Um, I guess, you know, um, I'm really excited about the program, and I have a couple questions about how we could even take it a step further, if that's possible. Um, as somebody who loves to cook and, um, you know, as a college student was involved in cooking as a community, you know, in a, a co-housing or co-op, you know, I see other private schools having the ability to get kids involved in the actual process of cooking. And is there any way we might be able to introduce this into the Amherst public schools? And if there are barriers, I'm just thinking, you know, we're about to, fingers crossed, you know, have a new school project. And what would we need to do to make it not just about um, farming, which I think is really important, but cooking is something that I'd like to think all of our kids and families can. Um, learn about and bring home, because I think it's really important to have that to, we get them for two meals out of the day, if we could, that third meal is hopefully being prepared at home, um, and how we can help transmit those skills as well to the, to the families and kids. One of our, one of our goals for the Kendall Grant is to hire an executive chef who would um, be helping to train and having training courses or classes to teach kids, not just kids, and partnering with um, Chef Sam for as long as we have him <laughs> to um, develop um, and work with the, the curriculum team from the farm to school to bring those, that kind of education into um, our food service program, not just having that in the classroom, but coming into the cafeteria and um, participating in, in um, cooking classes or demos and so on. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Dumling and then Mr. Nakajima. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll echo the thanks at coming in. This is, there are so many threads of excitement here. I'm, I'm not gonna pull on all of them. Um, it seems like you've had kind of a slow first year, Sasha, so you know, maybe you can pick it up, <laughs> pick it up the next year. I mean. Yes, I need to. <laughs> Um, no, but seriously, all of this is, I mean, I, we could have a two-hour meeting just talking about all the details in this, so. But we won't. Yes, we won't. <laughs> or a two-hour comment. Um, I, I really like how you described, um, as you evolve the, uh, the Farm to School program, of how you want to emphasize the community connection. Um, when I talk to people in the community who maybe don't have kids in school and are just saying, oh, and I talk about different initiatives, one of the things that always puts a smile on people's faces is, is the Farm to, to School. It just, it just has such a resonance in this community. It's like the, it's the book and the plow, right? The book is the education. The plow is the fact that yeah. we have such fertile land and local food, such an availability. So um, yeah, I, I would just encourage you to you know, keep thinking along those lines. It seems like you already are. Um, but that is, it is such a, an untapped potential, I think, mm -hmm. of community pride in our schools. Um, the, the sort of question I, uh, I had was, uh, so another programs with the breakfast in the classroom. Um, so the difference in the participation rates is really dramatic yeah. in those charts. And I'm just wondering what Financially, the limiting factor is for us going forward because it's great to see those those you know those moments. Um, but is is there uh, when we talk about maybe this is more of a shine question? But in terms of like ongoing funding, if mm -hmm. you know the ideal for all children to have easy, immediate access to breakfast, is it is it really just a financial grant uh, limiting factor, or what what is it that, that limits us? 
I'm, I'm, I'm sure Sean will jump in in the limiting part. I think one of the, the things is giving kids access to the breakfast and then we see the participation increase. And one of the things that we're looking to do is the universally free breakfast program where all the kids come in and have um, a free breakfast. It's accessible to them. But if, even if it's free and it's not at a time when they can have it, there is not a competition when you have to choose between having breakfast or choose between playing with your friends on the playground. And that seemed to be um, one of the factors. Once we, once we give kids that opportunity to play and also give them the opportunity to go into their classroom, socialize with their friends and have that breakfast, we'll see the participation increase. Dr. Morris, did you want to add to that? Yeah, so I, I think the other thing to add to, to what Ms. Palmer said is just the custodial implications, which are very real. Um, and I don't want to minimize the excitement that Ms. Palmer had. I share that excitement. And it means that um, as compared to our current programming where the breakfast is in the cafeteria and from a waste management perspective, you want to get that food out um, from rodents and you know pet, all those kind of ideas. Um, so that, that creates an... an significantly higher challenge when there would be at Wildwood, for instance, 22 classrooms uh, with lots of food waste uh, by 9 o'clock in the morning. So some of the implications, in the, and I really appreciate Ms. Palmer, I mean, there was a site visit to East Long Meadow, I want to say, yes. um, to try to work out some of those details, but it, some of it aren't actually just about the cost of the food, it's actually about how to keep the school safe and healthy uh, with the waste that naturally comes from the food. So it's a complex set of processes, and that's why I appreciate the site visit and getting that feedback. Principals yeah. went down uh, pretty early on a Wednesday um, to East Longmeadow to learn from those, uh, how it's working there. But I think that is one of the uh, challenges is, is not so much on the food side, it's what happens yeah. to the food at 9 o'clock. Mr. Nakajima? Huh. You know, it's funny. Um, I actually, earlier when you were starting and talking about breakfast in the classroom, I thought of this whole business because we spent an, a lot of time this year talking about custodial maintenance issues, particularly mm -hmm. with Wildwood and Fort River to um, a lesser extent. And um, I thought about bringing up that question, but I thought it'd be such a bummer that, <laughs> that I, did, I didn't want to because I thought it'd bring everyone down. Like, how do you keep mouse, you know, rodents out of the classroom and stuff? So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're going to figure that out. Um, and also, by the way, I don't think we, I don't, I didn't see the final PowerPoint distributed to us. If we could get it, it would be awesome because I just have some great other slides in there. Sure. But um, like you described earlier, the desire to get a grant for uh, an executive chef who could mm -hmm. do further work in the schools. I'm just wondering if you have a couple other highlights of the, of the farm to school work that you want to, that you could share with the committee that would pick our interest. Apart from, uh, so we have that, uh, we're planning to, we're in the process of um, writing our, our Kendall grant and one of the models that we're looking at, um, our different teams have roles that they're doing and I'm, I know they're here and they, it would be helpful for them to share, the, those team leads would be helpful for them to share their main focus um, I know the, the garden and curriculum specialist, Jennifer Reese is here and is happy to share some of those um, ideas that the curriculum and the community and the cafeteria team. And, and I should say, I, I know you're working on it, so I sort of just meant if there were general ideas you were excited about <laughs> that, you know. Uh, in Amherst. Uh, Yes, one, we are trying to build a business around um, farm to school. So what we're hoping for is that the garden can produce some of the, the school gardens um, can produce some of the food that we use in the cafeteria so they would grow a particular crop, whether it's cultural, they, Layla, or our, our garden specialist is working on growing one of my favorite crop, Kalaloo. And we're trying to um, purchase those from the school garden and um, make it into a, a, a business. So we have that kind of model in another, um, in the regional district, which we're trying to um, see. And, and hopefully that curriculum team can um, help produce it. They're working on specific crops that we can, um, they're growing that would supply us with some of that um, local produce in our cafeteria. 
we are working on, we do collaborate with the garden um, program. We have a, a, a pizza, we, they, they grow the produce and we use it into a, like a community meal, the kids participate. They'll, last year they did um, Green Monster Pizza, which we are planning on growing those, having the kids harvest it and having them cook it in the cafeteria. Ms. McDonald. So thank you. I was. Um, I also want to thank you for the the event. Was it just last Friday? Yeah. I was. I was lucky enough to come, um, and and taste these um, tasty treats that you brought tonight. But um, one of the things um, it, that really impressed me was not just the community that happens in the classroom when they're eating breakfast together, um, but also the learning. And I will never ever forget the look on the face of the boy when he learned what was in the green smoothie. <laughs> Um, and I won't spoil it for, for <laughs> um, because it, it, it gives them the learning of, of nutrition and that things that they don't think could taste ever taste good actually yeah. can taste good. And I think um, from the learning perspective of not just the, um, you know, being ready for learning because they actually have food in their tummies, but also just learning about the nutrition and, and that. So I, I am really impressed with the work that you all are doing. Thank you. Well, so I want to take a moment also uh, to uh, also think, I, you know, I agree with a lot of the comments that have been made here. Um, I have, a, I guess, one comment and a couple of questions, and uh, my questions are probably mostly directed to Dr. Morris and to Mr. Mangano, uh, but the comment, I guess, is for everybody. I was thinking about the, the food uh, waste implications as well and wondering if there's a way to, in much the same way that we've been talking about incorporating students or bringing them into the process of growing their own food and cooking their own food, if maybe we can also show them how to clean up after themselves, right, and, and make that a part of the learning experience, you know, because I think that a lot of times, uh, I know in our family this happens a lot, where we have, you know, uh, this almost this mentality of like, you know, you open a package, you throw that away, and you don't have to think about it ever again, right? But if it's your classroom and you're thinking about the impact of that wrap, that paper wrapping or that plastic wrapping, um, and the, the crumbs that are falling to the floor and all that kind of thing, that maybe we can think about that as a learning opportunity as well. Um, but as Mr. Nakajima said, I'm sure I'm sure you guys will all figure that out. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess my questions are: I do want to hear a little bit more about the limiting factor, quote unquote, as, as Mr. Demling mentioned, um, for increasing participation from a financial perspective, because I do think that uh, the financial impact, of course, is something that we, you know, we want to think about a little more carefully. So, uh, Mr. Mangano, I don't know if you want to address that or Dr. Morris. Yeah, so I'll address it for, in, in regards to the breakfast. So um, the universal breakfast is actually a really big opportunity for the finances. So the, the models we've looked at actually have the potential to really increase revenues. Um, it was on one of the slides, but because of time, it kind of went quickly. Um, <clears throat> but you can see we can actually increase revenues up to 150% by doing the universal breakfast. So it's not really a financial thing. It's more of a logistics to try to work it out because it's such a big shift in our model. Um, but that's actually one of the, the, the um, future things we're excited about in terms of <clears throat> excuse me, um, and boosting our, our revenues in the future. Um, and if we do that, then that money can get put back into the system and allow us to do other things in the future, increase the food quality, do other new initiatives. Um, so the breakfast in the classroom is actually something we're looking at as a, as a positive from the financial perspective. And is that revenue increase due to the cost uh, to families per meal? Is that what it is? or um, so, so under this model, breakfast would be free to all. Um, so the, it would actually reduce the cost to families. Um, the increase in revenue is because we would project a, a pretty significant increase in participation by having it after the bell, mm -hmm. um, because it would be made available every day to all the students in the classroom, um, and there's federal and state reimbursements for it, um, for all those meals that we serve. Thank you. That's what I was waiting for you yeah. to actually say out sure. loud. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, th there's money that comes <laughs> Well, and it makes it more, uh, you know, it, ma it makes it definitely more valuable and feasible, right, for a program like this, which is ultimately what we want. You know, we don't want to make money off of a program, but if it can sustain itself and we can actually show that to the community, then it makes sense, right? Mr. Demling, did you want to? Yeah, yes, just real quick on that, because that's a pretty amazing concept that by giving free charge breakfast to all, we would increase our revenue. So how, how reliable is that money going forward year to year? I mean, I, I won't make any comment about you know, federal stance towards you know, social programs. Um, 
reliable in terms of keeping pace with inflation. You know, I wouldn't bet on that. <laughs> um, but in terms of there being money for breakfast, I think, I mean, that's sort of the cornerstone of the, the USDA National School Lunch Program. Um, so I would expect that the money, the reimbursement for lunches and for breakfast is going to be there going forward. Dr. Morris? Yeah, and just, just to bolster what was being shared, uh, it was about a year ago, I think, that we actually had someone come in from the Greenfield Public Schools who you know, went through this transition to be in provision two um, to look at our participation rates, our poverty rates, which is a factor in the reimbursement, uh, and to net out or, or to predict out what the implications would be. So we do have some more detailed information about the implications for our district because we wanted to investigate it. And with, that could be an hour-long conversation tonight because it actually, it sh you have to show an increase. So you, you know, there's some advantages of when you start doing that versus uh, when you see the, you know, when this increase starts because it sets a rate that goes for years in the future. But um, all that to say that I know that um, this team is, is closely watching that and, and aware of the implications. Yeah, and, and just to give you a quick example, um, so our free and reduced lunch uh, per uh, percentage in the district is between 40 and 50 percent. Our breakfast, overall breakfast participation is only like 12 percent or 15 percent. So we know just looking at students that can get food for free already, there's a huge number of them that aren't for some reason, either because there's not an opportunity or something. Um, so we view this as a way to A, get the free the meals out to those who have that benefit already, um, and then also beyond that, go to students that just aren't eating breakfast anyway. So um, there's, a, there's a big market um, that we can serve by doing that. Great, thank you. And, and my other follow-up question was just about the implementation in the fall of 2019. So um, the 32nd answer, is that, is that set uh, for implementation? Will that be promoted among parents and caregivers? What, what does the rollout look like for that so that we can look for it? So I think the point that you raised earlier, uh, or was raised earlier, about working out logistics, particularly as food uh, in classrooms, given our experience last year, I think we still have more work to do on that before we can kind of do a more complete rollout. You know, I know that, you know, particularly at Wildwood, we've been in touch with our pest management company, um, and they'd like to see a little more time before we're having food in all classrooms every morning. So I think that's the piece that we're sort of still working out the logistics of, of, of how would that, more to the mechanisms that would be in place. So certainly when we're at that place to announce it, you'll hear about it loud and clear. Great. Okay, well, we look forward to that update then. And thank you so much um, for being here tonight. And um, I'm assuming that the treats stay. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the treats will stay. And I'll just let you know what's in them so you can make informed choices about what you're eating and drinking. So that's, a, um, that's an apple cinnamon muffin. Uh, that is a berry, uh, blueberry, peach, and yogurt smoothie. And then the green one... Uh, this, this one is a little bit different than the one I served at Fort River, but it's the same concept. It's pineapple, apple, green grapes, uh, celery, and this one actually has baby kale in it, but the one that I served that young kiddo uh, had spinach in it, and he, I think he was into it. I think he was okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank please. you very much, Ms. Palmer, and all of you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Dumling. So, in, in the spirit of not wasting, we have quite a, a treasure trove here. This, this, it appears there's more than enough for everyone in the uh, audience, eh? <laughs> I would say so. I think that if the, the audience wants to help themselves, there's, there's plenty of uh, treats here. Why don't we take a two-minute recess so that, because we lost our committee anyway. <laughs> Let's take a two-minute recess. <laughs> calling the meeting of the Amherst School Committee back to order after a very tasty little break that we took there, thanks to the uh, food services program at the Amherst Regional School District. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, Crocker Farm and Wildwood Strategic Planning Update. And I must say that this is also another item on the agenda that I'm very much looking forward to. Um, we had a conversation, well, several conversations actually, last year around uh, our planning for the dual language program at Fort River about wanting to make sure that we also heard from Crocker Farm and Wildwood in terms of um, what the planning was there for their schools, recognizing that we have some very special communities here in all three of our schools, and we did not want to just focus on Fort River with its new dual language program, but that we also wanted to make sure that uh, Crocker Farm and Wildwood were getting their 
uh, recognition. And so with that, Dr. Morris, um, do you want to sort of bring up the committee to speed? Yeah, so I'll do a quick introduction. Um, Mr. Shea is going to talk about Crocker first, and then Mr. Yaffe will talk about Wildwood. Um, and I think a common theme that you'll see, even uh, if you think about Ms. Chamberlain and what she's presented uh, about Fort River has been, yes, it's been focused on dual language, but really it's about student learning and how are students accessing high quality curricula, being engaged in their work, and how are schools moving forward um, this year. What's a little different uh, for this group is that they've been working with a different set of, uh, of folks to help move them along, and they have different teams in their school of staff members and community members. They've been working throughout the year uh, eventually to get you, uh, in late May or early June, a draft of school improvement plans moving forward. And so this is an update that uh, I asked the principals to bring forward to share you know, the work to date, uh, what's left, where they're headed, and to give you a flavor of um, what's to come at Crocker Farm and at Wildwood. Great. So with that, I'll pass it to Mr. Shea. Is this good for the Can you make sure that the light is on and the... Is it green? Yes. yes. Yeah, Perfect. Green. Thank you. There we go. There was a question there raised, go. sorry, it was light green, sorry, it was, it was a different green. <laughs> there was a question raised about the participation rates for students in um, eating breakfast in the morning time. So uh, I can tell you that our breakfast room in the morning is packed, but that doesn't mean to say the participation rates are high. It also means that students who actually don't get free and reduced lunch or breakfast actually show up in the morning and want to buy a breakfast. But here's the problem we have at our school, is that it's a, it's a good problem. We have this fantastic playground. Our buses arrive at 8.25 in the morning, and we go play out in the playground for about 20 minutes before teachers come and pick up students at 8.45. So invariably what happens is students have this little bit of an odd choice, right? Do I play in the playground or do I go eat breakfast? And so we're always encouraging kids to go eat breakfast, but then we're also encouraging kids to play. So if we get to a place where we can have this breakfast in the classrooms, we will solve a fantastic dilemma for ourselves, which is we're going to keep playing in the playground, run around, right? And, and on a sunny morning when it's maybe 25 degrees, I would encourage you to come someday. It's a thing of beauty. You can close your eyes and just listen to kids playing. It's wonderful. They could probably then go inside and have their breakfast. So we can get the two things done that we want to do in the morning. Play a little, eat, rather than have the choice. So that's the reason, not the main, it's probably one of the reasons our numbers are a little funky in that kids are choosing to go shoot hoops, run around, play. Um, we really don't want that to be the choice. Do we? we want both, right? So can we be greedy enough to have the two of them? I think we would take two of them. Um, so that was last, the last issue. Um, so as Mike said, uh, we are in the process of working with um, Dr. Kristen Rodriguez uh, on our uh, school improvement plan. Um, we've had a number of meetings since the last time we spoke, uh, and, and these meetings include upwards of 10 of our teachers and, and myself and uh, 9 or 10 of our family members who come to meet in my uh, rather small office. We sort of congregate there. And we've been working um, diligently, uh, I think since perhaps August. Uh, we've, we've probably two or three meetings since we last talked to you. We've also taken some of the work back to our staff meeting time to work with our staff to, to uh, update staff, but also to, to help them with their work. Um, so tonight I was just going to say a couple of quick things about, about the work and then perhaps you could ask a few questions. I'm not quite sure I can give you tons of answers, but, but I, can, I can just frame a few things. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do is that we're, 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 we're working hard to try to, in some ways, narrow the focus of all of the work that we're doing at our school. So, so perhaps, and I, I sent you a couple of slides, they, they weren't uh, terribly... Um, uh, specific, but there was one slide, for example, that we sent you, and it had some green writing on it, where it really what it was referencing was there's lots of things that are happening in the building even as we speak. So, so we're not like a, a, a train sitting at the station, right, waiting to be for a whole bunch of coal to be dumped into the, the back of our trucks and for us to take off. We're constantly in motion, and there's lots of things that are happening even as, as we speak. Um, so here's an example. Um, so one of the things that, that we've realized in our school over the years is that we have this, um, what's called a pre-referral process, right? So what that really means is that we're, we have this process where you um, work with, with, if a student is struggling a little bit, we work with uh, teachers and counselors and speech and language people and various other people, ELL teachers, um, RTI teachers, where we, we, we work to try to figure out, okay, what are, the, what are the needs of this student? 
um, and, and, and we use this process, a protocol, to help figure out, it's a, it's a pre-referral process for special education. And we came to realize over the last few years that the process itself, the protocol, wasn't that strong. It wasn't that good. So we've actually been working with uh, Katie Richardson and people from central office to help sort of solidify our process so that we don't do this. We don't over-identify um, youngsters or perhaps students uh, who are ELL students or uh, working class students who are, who are certainly over-identified in the SE uh, process. So we, we're working with other teachers to try and help uh, educate our teachers in this pre-referral process so that we actually sort of slow down the process and we don't jump into these referrals at, at such a fast rate. So that's a little piece of work that we do with everyone in the school. Um, there's lots of things happening. So our, our math recovery stuff, we talked about that the last time. We've had a woman come in this year. Her name's Jessica Minahan, and she's been doing lots of work with us on anxiety and trauma uh, with children. So, so I tell you those couple of things because none of those things are going to go away. We're going to continue to be working on initiatives even as we're working on our school improvement plan. And, and, and Michael even uh, agree with this. Uh, and this is not like to pick on Mike or central office people, but Mike and Marta and Faye and Doreen and various folks at central office, they're always nicely in, a, in the process of coming to us with ideas that they want us to be thinking about in our school. So that's not going to go away as well. So we're not going to develop this plan and all of a sudden Mike and everyone will say, hey, you guys are good, we won't bother you for the next couple of years. They're going to keep coming at us with new ideas that they want us to try out. So what we're trying to do in this plan, and, and um, I thought about this when I was running earlier, um, about nine years ago, I was involved in writing a plan. Peter Demley was involved in this plan, Mike Morris. And what we did is we come up with these three or four goals. And I can remember under the goals, there was like 10 initiatives that we were working on. And basically what we did is we sort of dumped all of the wonderful things we were working on in this plan. And in some ways, when I look back at it, it was kind of good because we showed everyone what we were doing. But I'm not sure it was lean enough to really say these are the three or four things we're committing to. We're working on all these other things, but these are the collective pieces that we're working on. So what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to sort of streamline this set of goals with some small initiatives that go with them, three or four initiatives, maybe three or four goals, three or four initiatives, and really as a collective in our school, work on those small pieces. Knowing full well, we're going to be continuing to work on other things as well, if that makes sense. And Mike, I, I can't really think of other things, but oh, I can actually. Uh, a math initiative, we're going to be working on some math stuff. The social studies frameworks have just changed in the state. So people's, people want us working on some uh, social stuff, stuff, social uh, studies stuff. I'm going to share with you in a minute, I'll, I think the health uh, curriculum in town, K through 12 health curriculum, needs a lot of work. I shared with you a little piece that we're working on. I can talk to that in a second. So all of that's coming as well. Whether or not it makes any of your plan, Possibly not, it doesn't mean to say we're not working on those things. Um, so our team of people have tried to narrow it down to three things that we're working on. And we think we're onto something with the goals. The initiatives will come later. We haven't quite got to that phase. We've got some of it, but I don't want to show you all that without having shared it with our staff and our families. But um, briefly, three goals that we're working on. So just a piece of paper here that, that came from my office. So. Mike mentioned this earlier, engaged learning, right? And so I'll read it. It's not terribly exciting so far, but it says, we will grow in our instructional practices to promote relevant and engaged learning and equitable access. It's really about high quality instruction. So this is one of the goal areas that we feel that is going to be part of our plan. I think what will happen is there'll be a subset of, of initiatives, small number that will come with this, that will say, this is what we're going to focus on. Um, a second big goal area that we think is really important is, um, sorry for the, it's just a piece of paper, relationships, right? So I'll read what it says. Um, and again, it's up for change. We will cultivate connections among students, staff, families, and our community. Now, it's going to be a little stronger than that when we get into what we're going to actually do. But this was something that our teachers and our families who met when we said, this is a really important piece for us. We really truly believe that if we're going to get anywhere, in terms of making sure that everyone in our school gets what they need and has access to what they need. The relationship piece, and we're pretty good at it, but we want to get much better at it. So this is going to be a goal area that we're going to be working on, and we're going to figure it, we're already starting to figure out some areas where we're going to hopefully excel. The third piece is really around social and emotional well-being of our students. 
and I'll read it. It says here, we will foster students' well-being to develop emotional strength and resilience. And it says well-being at the bottom. So it might not be the most attractive stuff that you see, but I think once we get to the place where we, you see what we're actually going to be doing, I think you'll probably get a little bit more excited. So again, I think we, we fed this stuff out through all of our staff and people get terribly excited. And there's nothing in any of these three things that anyone could say these are bad things that you should be doing in school, right? I think this is all pretty good stuff. Um, so these are the goal areas. We're going to start working a little bit uh, on initiatives that go with them. The last thing I just wanted to say, and, and I sent all of you in how you show up with the general public, I'm not quite sure, but just an example I sent to you recently um, or last week was that last year we realized after some consultation with a few parents that one of the pieces of our health curriculum, and we don't really have a K through 12 health curriculum, but one of the pieces that we do every year is we do some work on uh, puberty and sexuality. And, and we realized that the work we were doing in grades five and six, as much as it's only six or seven years old, it was dreadfully outdated and not entirely relevant to the work that we do in our school right now. So Tim Sheehan, uh, a number of our counselors, Jen Smith, our assistant principal, several well-intentioned, hard-working parents, all got together over the course of like six, eight weeks, and they developed a set of... Um, lessons that we're going to actually implement in grades four, five, and six. I think we sent you maybe a, a brief little clip of, of what we're going to do. We can actually show you the whole package at some point if you want to see it. So we're going to teach three lessons in grades four, three lessons in grades five, and three lessons in grade six. Now what we could have done is we could have waited until folks from like a health curriculum unit group committee probably two, three years down the line before we do all that, got together and said, let's improve this. And we said, no, we have the possibilities to do this now. And so the reason I shared with you, with you is because I think what will happen is when we get to the part where we really get into our school improvement plan, you'll see the potential we have in our building to actually do work that will have, I think, positive change for our students. So that was just a small example of something that we can do in a very short period of time. Um, I'm happy to report back at some point um, on how those health sexuality lessons go. Um, happy to share them with the other schools as well because we think it's work that's very important. Um, so again, I, I, I think we're a school that's trying to be a, a doing school, an action school. Um, and uh, anyway, I'll stop because it bore you all to death with... <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shea. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Um, I, I do want to pause here for a second to see if there's any uh, additional comments by Dr. Morris or questions from the committee for Mr. Shea or Dr. Morris. Well, um, I will say, uh, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your thinking. I also uh, really appreciate sort of the critical self-assessment that's going on um, at, at Crocker Farm among your staff uh, on all of these different pieces. I think it's, it's you know, difficult uh, at any stage for, for any team um, to be reflective and to think about the things that they're doing right, but also things that they can improve upon. So it, it really shows a lot of dedication and commitment to your, your students um, and your school community to be able to do that. Um, I think especially on the, the health curriculum, I, I certainly share. Uh, a lot of the concerns, especially when they were highlighted in the way that they were. Um, and I believe that it's something that the school committee has actually addressed prior um, with questions related to the health curriculum more broadly. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that this is you know, coming up as something that is part of that self-assessment yeah. and uh, steps to, to move forward. Um, I also wanted to say I, I really appreciate the focus on the social emotional skills and well-being. Uh, I believe and have mentioned this in, in other meetings prior to that um, this is where we can set ourselves apart I think from a lot of different school districts uh, because this is an area where we have excelled for, for some time in thinking about our students holistically and not just academically and it brings such an incredible amount of value to the whole person, the whole being. Um, and I think especially for students that may be struggling, uh, for students who are 
challenged you know, at home environments or who have dealt with adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress, that paying attention to uh, how they are feeling and how that feeling, those feelings manifest in their day-to-day -day lives is ex extremely important in order to make sure that we're seeing their, uh, you know, both educational and, and more generally uh, their other well-being. So I really commend you for thinking about this and, and putting that into words. I look forward to uh, a more developed uh, presentation yep. at some point with um, you know some further thinking on how to how to realize those goals and the initiatives beneath them, yep. because I, I do think that uh, you know in thinking about our individual schools having each school identify sort of their fortes, if you will. Um, is really important to you know to ensure sort of a, a healthy community there, yeah. but really you know again commend you, uh, you. Mr. Shea and your your teachers your educators for thinking this all through and bringing yeah. this to us tonight. Yeah, and if I if I could just add, I think you know there's a lot more information I could share with you right now, but I want to make sure we get that in front of all of our teachers before I, I bring it here. Right, so I don't want to be sitting up here tonight and giving you like many more of the, of, the, of the work below the goals but without having brought it to all of our teachers and all of our families. You know, so I'd like to do some of that first and then bring that back here. If I can just say this quick and back to the health curriculum piece, what we're realizing is that there's information I think some of our youngsters need, not when they're 14, 15, 16, but when they're 9, 10, 11, and 12. So that's for us, the sort of impetus was to sort of get moving because we don't want to wait, right? It doesn't make any sense to wait to get information to kids when they really need it. Um, at a younger age. Two other quick things. There was a theme about what is our identity or what does it mean to be in our school? And I think what one of the things that we realized is that we didn't want to set up in the beginning and say, this is our identity and these are all the things we're going to do. We, we, we're interested in sort of seeing how our identity evolves through the work that we're doing. So we've got some sort of notion of us being this sort of community, and I don't want to say community school, but there is a notion of how community comes into the whole aspect of the stuff. And, and, and I don't see that fallen away. I'm, what we're very interested in is how, see how that word evolves and how that sort of meaning evolves. And, and the last thing I would just say is that teachers are going to do some of their own individual work and ideas, and, and, and we're not trying to make clones of everyone. What we're really talking about in this school, school improvement plan is what are the sort of collective action steps that all of us in our school are going to commit to. People are going to still have their, their expertise and some of their specialties, but we're looking at a small number of things that every single person in our building and all of our students will have access to and all our families will be part of some collective action steps is the piece that we're looking for. Thank you. Mr. Nakajima? Yeah. Um, I, I think what you just did in sort of a summary uh, did uh, a wonderful job of bringing to a, a point um, something I was going to sort of grasp at complementing what you're doing and, and it appears you're doing is um, I love the fact that you decided that instead of trying to create a plan that mirrored all the goals and objectives and activities of the school and sort of valued them and then tried to provide some measure of progress in those areas, that instead you have the ambition of saying, look, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna winnow this down, there are gonna be lots of important things to do, but here we're gonna prioritize. So I think that's exactly right. And I think also the challenge then, and you were just summed it up better than I could have asked you the question or commented, is how do you then create a dynamic in which everyone is genuinely and authentically participating in setting a, sub, a, you know, a more focused set of goals. And I think if it's done right and done well, it's, it's it, I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing the details too. So I think the, 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 the goals or objectives you're setting, the broader vision obviously resonates and feels good and sounds right. I think when you bring it down to how you're gonna be reflecting that back in specific initiatives like you did here with health, um, is, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see because I think it, the, the sum of the, the value of it is probably greater than even just the individual elements, even though the individual elements could be really critical. The value to the community as a whole. Right, and I, and I, I would just add briefly that including yourselves sitting up there and, and, and myself sitting here, all of us have our own sort of individual talents and specialties in areas of like interest and passion. And, and so we all want to maintain those things but when we're looking at this plan, we want to think about what are our collective sort of like interests and passions, right? And putting those all together for, the, for this one plan. Thank you, Mr. Shea. So I think I'll call up Mr. Yaffe. Um, and it might take a minute just to get the flash drive loaded. I'll come over and try to help with that. <laughs> 
Okay. Just come up to the microphone, here. Make sure that the button is pressed and that the bright green light is on. <laughs> we have to make a distinction, we realized. Thank you, Dr. Morris. So um, uh, as I'm listening to Derek, I just, one thing that first struck me that I want to say in the introduction is just how much we're in sync as the two schools, and certainly Fort River, Diane always likes to chime in and say, yes, we too, over <laughs> at Fort River. And, and I think what Derek was saying is so valid and true, you know, that we want to focus on things that are collectively there's a collective commitment among the Wildwood staff and community, among their families and among the children. And in doing so, we've tried to really involve everybody as much as possible. And as Derek was also saying, focusing on a few things that we can just say, yes, this is who we are at Wildwood. And similarly, we've talked about how the identity that certain themes are emerging. And I think you'll get a sense of that and we, we put together just a very simple, simple slideshow. And uh, we, this is where we ended up. So before we look at that, we'll just, I'm just going to give you a context. And um, we're calling these the Wildwood Pillars, uh, the foundations of our school. And this started with, at the beginning, as we talked about a few months back, surveying families at the open house and then online and then surveying our staff. You know, what do you love about Wildwood? What, do you feel, what areas do you feel like we should improve? And out of that emerged what we felt, we categorized everything, if you can imagine, that was quite a daunting task into these five areas. What really emerged though, or, or what I would say is, one of the things that really rang true for people about what they loved about Wildwood is, is the sense of community as Derek was saying about Crocker. I think there's that feeling in each of the schools that this is a community and that Wildwood is a welcoming community. And that when you walk through the door, no matter who you are, where you're from, <coughs> what you love, as we say to the children, you can be that person at Wildwood. That's what we aspire towards. So that's the foundation. And then what Chris is gonna talk a little bit about the inquiry group process that we created out of these five pillars that emerged from everybody's feedback of what they felt were the most important parts about Wildwood. Yeah, so after the uh, stakeholders all, all weighed in and we collected all that data and then the school instructional leadership team looked at the data, came up with these five broad areas and we decided to label them pillars. Uh, Nick and I have talked quite a bit about how professional developments are really an opportunity to model best teaching practices and so we want kids to do inquiries and follow their interests and so we kind of tried to do that with the staff as well we divided into groups, so each staff member got to choose what inquiry group they'd be a part of, and, uh, and then research something that they're interested in, um, or want to learn more about. So, uh, yeah, so the members of the school, yeah. Click? Yeah, click, click. Okay, so here they are. Yeah. And so then we decided, in terms of that modeling idea, to use something that we've started to learn about at all the schools, or restorative circles. And when we've done this with the staff, it, each time, it's surprisingly powerful. Just bringing people together in a group of 10 or 12 in a circle and setting norms and just talking from the heart and listening deeply. And so each, like we say with children, we believe in choice. So each staff member chose what inquiry group um, and said why this is important. And once people started to speak, it was a very powerful experience. And then they talked about what, again, what they, what they hope for. What, does it look, what would it look like if it was done well at our school? And then to get concrete, can you think of a time in your own practice as an educator where you felt you did curriculum design well, or you felt you did social justice or equity well? And then we talked 
Um, also about what do you wonder, what do you want to find out? So it led that to the question of what we're going to explore as a, in, in these small groups. Can you do this one? Sure. Then we went to uh, I believe statements. And so people believe a lot of things. We came up with really exhaustive lists the staff <laughs> developed. And then the job of each of the inquiry groups was to kind of funnel through those, again, categorize them, come up with some basic themes that they saw within, within each of the I believe statements. Um, and then draft a statement and we present and then we're kind of at the we're stage. not there yet yeah, yeah. we're not quite there yet but we are going to present we're in the in the process of developing statements that to then check in with everyone all the stakeholders make sure we all agree on this and then and then continue with the process yeah and like when i heard derek talk about that idea of this collective these are the things that collectively we agree on that's what we hope to have so with this shared value statement around so one of the pillars is family partnership well, this is going to be endorsed by the entire staff. They're going to say, yeah, this is what we value with family partnership. Nick, could I jump in here? Yeah, sure. Just, just to note that um, having been at Wildwood at the beginning and as one of these sessions that was using a, uh, a circles model uh, approach, I think two things stood out to me. One was the equitable participation. So no matter if you're an extroverted staff member who is very comfortable talking group, the structure of it meant that everyone had equal airtime. And that shifts dynamics when yeah. it shifts. I mean, just it, the other thing was, um, Nick may remember this, that I would, thought I was going to stay the whole time. I opted not to stay for the whole faculty meeting because the conversations felt so intimate that actually I felt like my role would be, um, I couldn't be an observer, right? There was no, and I wasn't looking to be a participant, but um, the level of dialogue was so rich and, and, and really felt, to use that word again, intimate, that I opted to, to, to watch one or two for a couple minutes, and then I said, you know, this, this is, I think I'm getting in the way. I would get in the way as an observer uh, because of that shared commitment um, to work collaboratively as a group and the shared um, participation of staff members. So I just want to note that it really did feel different from other dialogues that either, you know, I've seen in, in, in faculty meetings, and I appreciate the kind of approach of really getting everyone on the staff to be an equal participant in the work. And, and I think those process benefits when we're talking about shared commitments at the end, make a huge difference that every, all staff members feel that they were um, and were actively a part of um, the creation exercise. So I just want to note that. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's so important. And, and then it's also, it ties into saying that we, do, we did this as a staff. You can do it with your students, you know, and, sim, and you'd have similar benefits and you'd be hearing voices that you don't normally hear um, and building community so I'll save the next part for the, for the action steps. Because what this is saying really is that values are great, but what, real, what then matters is to have real change. Can we name specific behaviors that would make our values real? So that's where we're at now. Um, go ahead. Yeah, like six years ago, we did a visioning oh, process. Yeah, right. And it kind of <laughs> didn't have the teeth of the steps that Dr. Rodriguez has taken us through in terms of coming up with smart goals and we, we believed all these things, but then we're, you know, what, what's the concrete steps? What's the concrete action? So I really appreciate that in this process, we're going to come to those and, and may really make some commitments as, as a staff and as, as a school. So that's what Chris was just talking about. And as Derek was talking about, okay, what can we really commit to? There will be this individuality, the creativity that takes place in every classroom but using the restored, the circles as an example. So that's one of the best practices in, in trauma sensitive schools. So if you're at Wildwood, is that something that you'll see some version of that in every classroom? Or, you know, that's so much more powerful than, oh, that's happening in that classroom, but not in this classroom. Hmm. Um, so that's what we're, that's our next step is like, under, uh, we're gonna give you an example, but under each pillar, we have the shared value statement and then a plan of action. Uh, and again, just focusing on a few that we can all say, yes, we're gonna do this. So that's, this was our task for the inquiry groups. We've covered most of this. The one part that, it has a blue number four, I'm not sure why, but there it is. Because <laughs> that's the part we didn't talk about. We're at the point now where to really get uh, full agreement and buy-in, we're going to check in now. It's more than halfway through and say, okay, here's where we're at. Here's what each group, each group will present and then get feedback from the full staff. 
So this is an example we thought that of a shared vision statement that the uh, this inquiry group came up with. They haven't checked in with the whole staff yet to get it revised and whatnot, but we thought it was an a interesting statement. So I'll I mean, you could, you could start. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So we believe that a commitment to social justice needs to be integrated into all aspects of the school day in order to be effective. We will strive to make our school one where teachers and students bring a critical equity lens where it becomes clear that community members' identities, beliefs, backgrounds, and abilities are actively valued. This means that all students should have equal access to learning and students and staff should experience equitable and considerate treatment from each other. To reach these commitments, we believe that staff need to engage in reflection with regard to our own biases and assumptions and or lack of knowledge about those who are different from us. Whew. So, um, like we said, this is the value statement and then, mm -hmm. okay, what are a few core practices and, and uh, Dr. Rodriguez uh, has outlined, okay, then you would go from there this is sort of giving you the sense of the initiative, and then what would you go from there to say, this is your SMART goal, and then what's your action plan to, so that's, that's what each group, this group also started to outline that, and actually uh, circles, restorative practices were a part of that. Whoops. So that's it for the <laughs> presentation. Thank you so much uh, yep. to both of you for, for coming here tonight and for presenting this. Um, I'm just going to jump in very quickly with a few comments, and I, and I also uh, just realized that we're running a little bit behind in our sure. agenda tonight. Yeah. Um, but that's okay, because we had some very important presentations about what's going on in our schools, so we thank you both for, for coming. Um, I really just wanted to say I, I love the process that you've detailed for uh, getting, I guess, picking the brains of your, of your staff and educators to come up with this you know, vision statement and just uh, to get agreement in all the different uh, areas and principles that you, that you want to work towards. Uh, it's just so uh, you know, refreshing to hear of a team that's working together in such a way. And so you know, th that really jumps out, I think, in this whole process. Um, and, and the fact that you're working on getting specific steps together to come up with you know, action steps and goals, that, that's actually really, really great. Um, I also just wanted to commend you for identifying social justice and equity as a top priority for Wildwood School. And I know that this is true across our district. This is, you know, those are values that we hold dear to us. Um, and when put into an actual strategic planning process, it means that we're holding it sort of top of mind and, and creating that as a priority. And it's just wonderful to hear you, both of you talking about this and the, and the steps that you're taking to ensure that that actually continues as a, you know, as a central theme to the work that you're doing. So I just want to take a moment to thank you for that. Um, I'm going to turn to the committee to see if there's any, any you know, brief comments or questions that you have for uh, Mr. Yaffe or Mr. Eggmeyer. Mr. Dumling. Uh. I, I won't just say what, what she said, but what she said, you know, I, th I think it's um, the, the emphasis of those values has been great. Um, but one, one thing I, I want to get like a, a bit of a clearer sense of just so we can sort of set our expectations for the next few months is that so like with um, with Fort River, the dual language program is a is a fundamental curricular change right to the that affects the whole aspect of the school. Um, and, and what we've heard so far from the, in the planning stages for Crocker and and Wildwood are, you know, the, the high level sort of visioning and values and then goals. Um, is, so will, do you think, like uh, Principal Yaffe, this, this, this will necessarily lead to a specific unifying curricular change? Like, for example, we've talked about project-based learning or self-directed learning. There, there are other, you know, examples of this kind of major curricular shift that could happen in every classroom. Or is it more, we've identified our values, now we have a clearer focus on what our efforts are and now they're, we're doing things more consistently. I guess I'm just sort of, I'm, I'm wondering what, what, what the end looks like. Yeah, I, I think this is, a, <laughs> I think this is a, uh, if this is an opportunity to really have that kind of fundamental shift in, in the curriculum and how students learn and, and you know, both at Crocker and at Wildwood, you notice student engagement was a pillar, you know, um, and so that's really where this journey started. I would say eight and a half years ago, looking at how 
how can students be truly engaged? And that led to student ownership of, its, of their own learning, and that led to pro So it's a, I see a real through line there. I think this is an opportunity to, to create something that is a big shift in that regard. Um, and that project-based learning, character development, they're intertwined. But how, how can we have students, and we have examples, we have exemplars in all the schools where you would say, yeah, that's it, that's what we're talking about. We want to visit other schools um, that we feel are, can show us some things about how they're, they're, um, they're, they've made that kind of change. So I, I think it, I, I would say yes, that is true. And that's what, that's what I would hope and, and want at, at Wildwood and, and I know that similarly at Crocker Farm that people really want our students to be fully engaged, um, to be citizens of the world, so it's tied into social justice to feel like they're making an impact on the world, um, and that's the way to do it, is like for them to f undergo this process of inquiry um, and, and have questions that they're asking that they want to pursue. Does that answer the question? Yeah. And not that this was missing from your answer, Nick, yes. but I, I do think uh, the idea that a lot of the model schools we're looking at, like we went to uh, some expedition learning schools, the high-tech high schools I'll spend some time with, they really have served our underserved students, which is yes, real equity point. concern. That I yeah. think this is not just project-based learning. That is something that's great. But it also has some real-world implications in terms of how the achievement gap is closed. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I think that the, the thing you're talking about, Peter, that there's an article that I, I shared with staff, which is going from the dessert, project-based learning, you know, this type of learning, going from the dessert to the main course. So my goal would be to make this the main course at, at our schools, because I believe in it. I believe this is the way kids learn best. Great. Okay, um, if there are no further comments or questions from the committee, thank you so much again for your time tonight. We really appreciate it, and I hope you can grab some treats on your way out. <laughs> <laughs> We're being very magnanimous tonight with, you know, this food. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the uh, FY20 budget vote. Uh, we've had several meetings already reviewing um, upcoming year's budget. And I know that Mr. Mangano has shared uh, updates with us recently. And it looks like he's got some slides ready for us. Yeah, it is. Very few, just um, a quick recap. Um, so, quick recap. Um, the proposed budget is 23838854 which is the amount that was given as guidance from the Finance Committee in the fall. Um, it's a 2.6% increase over last year's budget, and it currently includes $261,576 of net additions. Um, and that chart below is just something you've seen before, which is the, the increases in the level services budget over last year. Um, the primary change from the budget hearing to now um, is the addition of a .3 curriculum clerical position. Uh, we talked a little bit about this on the region side, um, but the, the purpose of this addition is to allow the communications position that we're proposing to focus entirely on communications. Um, without this addition, that position would have some curriculum duties. Um, but by adding this, <clears throat> it allows that person to focus all on um, communications. And <clears throat> this is the motion language. Um, there's the traditional um, top part, which is to approve the budget for FY20. In the part below, you've seen this in the region, but not in Amherst before. Um, because we've included a contribution to the Special Ed Stabilization Fund, there's this second piece um, that we explicitly vote that um, for, the, um, for the budget. And I'm happy to answer any questions on the budget. Great. So um, at this time, if the committee has any questions or comments uh, on the FY20 budget, I will also accept a motion. Mr. Demling? Um, just a quick question. I think I asked you this before, but the 2.6, that's above the town's 2.5 mm -hmm. guidance. Have we had discussions with the town and with regards to how they're going to react to that? So, so that, is, that is the 2.5. Um, it, it came out a little bit higher this year because of the way the, the town does the adjustment for charter and choice tuition. 
Um, so in the past, you know how sometimes it's been below 2.5 because our charter and choice have been growing. Um, because for the first time, our charter and choice actually didn't grow, it stayed flat. It actually was slightly above the 2.5. So it's, this is the number that they gave us um, based on the 2.5% across the board. It's just it's the way that little calculation happens before they give us the number, if that so, makes sense. Just to put a finer point on it, the, the town has approved then this, yes. this increase. This is the number it, that they're using the, in their the projections. Yep. Thank you. Mr. Nakajima? I move uh, the Amherst School Committee adopt a budget of $23,838,854 uh, for the fiscal year 2020 for the Amherst Elementary Schools. Further voted that included within this budget proposal is a contribution of $50,000 to the Special Education Stabilization Fund. Okay, the motion has been moved. Do we have a second? Second. Any further questions or comments for Mr. Mangano or Dr. Morris? All right, all those in favor? It is unanimous. Thank you, Thank you. very much. I just want to say also, um, this hasn't come up before, but I want to thank you, Mr. Mangano, for all the work that you put into this, and especially for creating that summary uh, outline the at the feedback. very beginning. I really appreciate yeah. it. No, thank you. <laughs> I actually hope that, um, you know, kidding aside for future years, that we actually do incorporate that, because we have it at our regional budget yeah. level. Um, I do feel like it helps to focus the, the discussion on where the areas of improvement or changes yeah. have taken place in the budget. Um, and we made such incredible investments this year on you know really important things, mm -hmm. including the dual language program right. and yeah. other things that we've talked about right in committee meetings you know throughout the year. But to highlight that for the budget, you know this is what I tell everybody: our budget is actually how we create policy here uh, on the school committee and at the district level. So it is you know arguably I think the most important uh, document that we have and that we can share with the community and everything. So if it can highlight the things that we've considered important and that's what we want to invest in all the better. Yeah, now that it's in there, it's there to stay. So Awesome. Yep. Thank you so much. Dr. Morris. Yeah, and I think in particular, as, as Amherst has had a change in government and, you know, on the regional side, um, that meeting is coming up sooner because of timeliness of other four ta three towns, but at the Amherst side, it'll come up. We have different people reading our documents, um, so I think the executive summary to, to, uh, plays a perhaps larger role mm -hmm. um, now that uh, our former government's changed and the town manager and the, the town council looking at it in a slightly different way than when our former government was different. So um, appreciate the suggestion, appreciate Mr. Mangano's work on that. Yeah, yeah and uh, as always on all the budgets, if you have um, suggestions or feedback or anything you think could enhance the document, um, get that to myself or Dr. Morris, because um, we're always looking for new ideas. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next time on the agenda is the FY20 capital update. Mr. Mangano, I think that's so, you again, think, or? Uh, this, I think, will be a brief agenda item. We just put it on here, so Mr. Mangano, or certainly Ms. McDonald, or Ms. Nakajima from JCPC, just as that process has gone on, we thought it would be wise to just have a placeholder for a, mm -hmm. a brief update about how JCPC is going, if there's any updates to be had. Yeah, so um, we are just about done with the department hearings. We have one more on Thursday. Um, and then the JCPC group is going to start prioritizing those. Um, as typical, there are more requests than there is money. Um, so there's going to be some adjustment process to, to get to a, a balanced um, amount. Um, I think for the schools, and, and Mr. Nakajima or Ms. McDonald can weigh in on this as well, um, I think the, the most interesting discussion occurring is around the HVAC system. Um, so what we propose is the replacement of the HVAC system at Wildwood and Fort River $400,000 each. Um, some new information that um, Mr. Roy Clark, the facility director, brought to the last, last, yeah, the last JCPC meeting um, because there was a little bit of concern about are we going to put this amount of money into the buildings, if they're going to be replaced in X number of years. Um, so he brought some information on the possibility of leasing portable um, chiller systems, HVAC systems. And so that's sort of a discussion we're having now is sort of the, the viability of that, the feasibility of doing that. Um, and it's, it's a really tough conversation to have because it's, <laughs> it's a lot of money. Um, we want to make sure there are no operational issues for kids, you know, like there was um, this summer. Um, and we want to use the money as wisely as we can. So it's a, this is one of those, this kind of exemplifies those difficult conversations we have with the, the new schools on the horizon. 
Sure, and also as we've established, I think in this committee, um, the you know how important it is actually to make sure that we are taking care of these very immediate needs yeah. in our schools. Uh, regardless of what happens with our application to the right. state for, for aid and new buildings or renovations right. or anything like that. Um, Mr. Nakajima or Ms. McDonald, do you want to comment on the process so far? Yeah, I was going to say, I think that the big thing that the JCPC has done is wanted to kick the tires on that very question of um, how do we know that investments we're making are being prioritized in a way and thought through in a way in which if there's a new building in the near future, hopefully, uh, that we we haven't spent money we didn't have to, uh, and that there's thinking going into that. Uh, the the chiller example is a, is a good one because between Wildwood and Fort River, there's eight hundred thousand dollars in there for chillers. Um, Mr. Uh, Roy Clark thought it would be around uh, fifty thousand dollars to lease per year um, per chiller, which means it, uh, pre a site preparation cost aside, it might take you eight years to get to the point that you spent the amount of money you would buying it. Um, but and it was the things that Mr. Mangano is going to work through, like um, how do you actually analyze that? Because he asked the perceptive question the other day, that there's a resale value in chillers so that we might be able to actually sell it and net out some of the uh, sunk costs for the investment. And there's also a lot of other peculiarities around when, how many months you have to run them, yeah. how easy it to get one. They're not, you can't go to, Costco or something or Walmart and get one off the shelf. Right. And so it's actually hard to get them. And so figuring out how would you have the lead time to know that you can get the equipment in place and when it can be a matter of shutting down the school mm -hmm. if it fails. So, so the cool thing, if you want to call it that, is the JCPC asks a ton of questions <laughs> and really works through these questions in a great, great detail. Um, but, I, but I think that because of that, the sense that, that the school district um, as well as our school committee is taking seriously. Um, obviously, we all want to get into a new school, but also taking seriously the things we need to do now to keep the buildings in good repair, repair and safe. Um, I think they're getting a good sense of that. Yeah. Great. Ms. McDonald, is there anything you want to add? Okay. Well, thank you both for serving on that uh, subcommittee. It's really valuable and helpful. Mr. Dumling, did you have any comments? Yeah, just a quick question. Um, so we've received a, a suggestion from community members uh, to possibly add money to uh, this, this year's request to explore um, possible expansion of Crocker Farm as one of the options for the reaching 600. Um, I just did wanted to see if members uh, are from our committee that are on the JCPC had thoughts of that or superintendent. You go ahead. Sure. So, uh, my my, I appreciate the suggestion. I appreciate people who are really trying to, uh, in my opinion, uh, ask good questions and be have the district as prepared as we can be uh, in the, if we have the good fortune of being invited into the MSBA process. Um, I think my challenge is I prioritize the needs that need to happen right now for our buildings that, that those of you who watched the meeting last night, we heard in great detail. Um, when I compare things that are uh, could be necessary, might be able to be integrated into a future process versus urgent needs, right? So, you know, someone last night, a public speaker, used the kind of healthcare analogy of, you know, if you're in the emergency room, what do you see first? And so that sort of is my thinking. So, if if the town and JCPC were to say, yeah, we've got flexibility and funds, um, you know, do I think that's a, a bad idea? I don't think it's a bad idea, but. When I compare it to chillers and that conversation that was just being talked about, um, I think you know kids come first, and for now we have the kids in the school right now that are in and staff, in sometimes substandard situations. And so until those things are addressed, I can't think of adding for something else. And that's not to say it's not a good idea; it's not appreciated from my perspective. Um, but from a prioritization point of view, for me, it's can we take care of the things that we absolutely need to take care of right now? And is there excess to do more than that? And that's a question for JCPC, not for me. So it's a question of priorities. Mr. Nakajima. Yeah. Um, and I, I, having looked into a little bit, and I know Ms. McDonald as well, um, I think it's actually a good idea to do in terms of a, some sort of assessment of the viability of expansion space at Crocker Farm. Uh, and I think it would be worth doing I think I served on JCPC last year, and so I've already been through the sort of ringer of this process of hearing about a number of things that are really valuable, some of which um, 
I remember last year the fire department came forward with the desire for new Bluetooth walkie-talkies that would be integrated into their helmets so that they wouldn't have to um, take their helmet off or and use a walkie-talkie that's a, like an old Motorola um, when they're in the middle of a fire emergency in a building um, and in another setting. So that you know the state of the art these days is you can communicate um, to back to the truck or to other people, your fellow firefighters, um, through Bluetooth. It's, it's not even really like state of the art technology. It's been a few years, but. Um, and I remember last year that was not one of the capital requests that was approved um, by the town JCPC. Um, and you, you can just immediately see what an urgent need that is. So the, the challenge you get to when the JCP is, JCPC and the town manager's recommendations are winnowing things down is that you have all of the things that we know we urgently need as a school district. Then we have all the things that the other town departments need urgently. And then you have all these sidewalks and roads you gotta fix and you only have a limited amount of money. Yeah. So the, the point I'm making on this, and I'm sorry for doing a long, but this isn't, if you're not at JCPC, you don't necessarily get to see how the sausage is made in this regard, that there are many really valuable requests that come forward that are perfectly worth doing that the town can't afford to do and has to prioritize. And I would probably put this in that basket that if the, if the money was available, I think it would be a perfectly good thing to do, particularly to sort of continue this collaborative consensus-oriented dialogue we've talked about, which I think we all value. Um, the challenge is um, I want the fire department to get their Bluetooth headsets this year. Thank you. Ms. McDonald. I'll echo a lot of what you've just said. I won't say it again to some time. Um, but this being my first time on JCPC, I think it is um, uh, absolutely true that at least we, we still have one more presentation tomorrow yeah, or Thursday. Thursday. But, um, it, it, all of the requests are urgent. All the requests are important. Um, and so it's not a question. I also agree that this is a really interesting and good idea, and it's something that we should do. And I think the real, the real question is, where does it fall in our priorities as well as the overall town, town priorities? Because everything, I, I can't, you know, maybe there's a couple thousand that is probably, you know, easy to kick down the road. Um, and the questions, it is absolutely true that JCPC asks a lot of really great questions. And so the questions really are getting at not should you do this, is this a bad idea or a good idea? It's what is the implications if we don't do it this year? Mm -hmm. What are the alternatives? So the, the lease or buy question on the chillers is a really fascinating one. But, it, but the, that's the, the type of question on a very large scale but that we're asking um, and getting asked on, on much smaller scales. And I think that's a vet, really valid question to ask about this. And um, uh, we I talked with the community member who brought it forward um, today and really tried to understand, and, I, and this might be a question for you, um, uh, Dr. Morris, is what, uh, is it something that can easily be folded in into, into A, the feasibility process, assuming we get into the MSBA um, pipeline in December? and is that in fact a delay in, in sort of decision making if we wait and, and bring this forward a year from now? Um, I, I asked that question, but also knowing that a big chunk of the ask and motivation, I think, um, this is my interpretation, is putting our money where our mouth is, that we are not sort of already closing the door on anything but a K through five um, option. And I think that's a, a sort of a really valid um, ask of the committee. Dr. Morris, yeah. um, and then we're so gonna I, move on. Yes. Absolutely, <laughs> oh, that's okay. uh, um, I'll be brief. So I think uh, three things. One is I just wanna say that I appreciate the community interest. I mean, if you think about our capital plan and how it's evolved even the last two months, it's based on meetings with lots of people. So uh, we talked about the last, well, not the last meeting, the last meeting that wasn't about SOI, um, about you know that Mr. Roy Clark and myself and Ms. Fay met with Wildwood faculty uh, based on the air quality report that uh, the, the our local association completed and we actually shifted some funds because ripping up carpets was one of the recommendations and after reading that we said yeah we need to do that and we need to change some things so we it is a flexible process and if this gets funded or not we want people to continue to offer feedback and continue to have ideas that they share with us because it's really valuable um, I think on the the question you're asking um, in my opinion it certainly could be folded into a feasibility study um, 
you know, I think the delay, in my opinion, probably wouldn't be too great. And that being said, any delay is too long, right? You heard me say that last night, and Mr. Mr. The Chair say that last night. So I appreciate that point of view, um, but I, I don't think it would be a, a terribly long process to evaluate that option. It would need to be evaluated very seriously, so I'm, the commitment is there to do that if we were fortunate to get invited in. Um, but I, I don't think it would um, slow down the process because it'd be a, a set of architects, it'd be the MSBA process, you're having to look at multiple options. Even if we think we've looked at it before, we're going to have to look at everything again because that's the nature of the, the process they'll make us go through. So um, is, it, is it a good idea? I think, yeah, it's a good idea. I think it really comes to priorities and needs, you know, as, as Mr. Nakajima said, both within the schools but also across the town. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, and thank you uh, again, Ms. McDonald and Mr. Nakajima, for being a part of this, um, and we look forward to the future updates on this, on this topic. Uh, moving us on to the next item on the agenda is school choice vote. Dr. Morris? So last month we had a school choice hearing. Um, I don't recall, I can't remember if there was, um, there wasn't a tremendous number of comments perhaps, but um, the recommendation I made, uh, which continues today, is to remain a school choice district. Uh, to be clear, we're not looking to expand our school choice program um, beyond the current where we are currently, uh, but we do anticipate, uh, particularly in this year of unusual kindergarten enrollment, first time around for dual language, to have the flexibility to fill seats via school choice, uh, we believe would be kind of financially a good idea as well as educationally gives us some flexibility uh, as we see how the enrollments play out. So the recommendation would be for the Amherst Public Schools to vote to continue being a school choice district. So Dr. Morris, I, I uh, note that we don't have a, we don't have any language for, for this. Yes. Um, so we're gonna wing it, I guess, <laughs> if the committee is ready for a vote and anyone's feeling brave enough to, uh, um, to make a motion. And of course, I'll take any comments or questions uh, for Dr. Morris, too. Dr. Morris? Just to clarify, the state put out new guidance not that, maybe a month ago, something like that, where actually, um, if you didn't vote, you would, by default, sort of become a school choice district. You sort of have to vote not to become a school choice district. That being said, I think an affirmative vote to continue being one is clarifying. Thank you. Mr. Nakajima. I move that the Amherst School District remain a school choice district for the uh, 2019 2020 academic year. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Demling. Any further comments or questions? All those in favor? All right. Thank you very much. It's unanimous. Okay. Uh, last item on the agenda is uh, gifts. And we don't have any gifts. Thank you, Ms. Westmoreland. Okay. Uh, school committee planning. Dr. Morris, you want to? Sure, son. Next week we have a joint meeting, um, so it's come, you know the beginning of the meeting is a joint meeting. But I'm just going to say there is an Amherst School Committee meeting next Tuesday night uh, with two topics of the joint meeting. The first is a uh, the final report and presentation uh, from the Regional Master Use Study. It's a joint meeting because it talks about sixth grade, so um, it allows Amherst School Committee members and Pelham School Committee members to ask questions with that mindset. And the second is uh, a follow-up that Mr. Sheehan will do on the math, the external math report, which is 6 through 12, again, for the same reason we made it a joint meeting, so that committee members would be enabled to have dialogue about the sixth grade implications of that. And just a reminder that prior to that, uh, so last night at the town council meeting, uh, we received some friendly edits actually to the SOIs, the statements of, of interest for the MSBA application. Uh, and Dr. Morris uh, is working with uh, Mr. Roy Clark to make those edits. Um, we believe that they actually will help, uh, you know, strengthen the applications. Um, so we wanted to share that with the committee and that of course will require a re-vote uh, because we already voted on, on this item. Um, I will not be at the meeting next week on Tuesday. I'll be actually out of town. So I believe our vice chairs agreed to uh, <laughs> preside over that meeting uh, and that vote, but I just wanted to make sure the committee was aware of that as well. Any other items for um, our next, next meeting? Um, so, um if April 23rd is the date um, of the next meeting because the April break, it ends up being a little later than would typically. So um, I think at that point we'll have a Fort River feasibility study final mm -hmm. report. Mm -hmm. um, we would like to offer a dual language update since the first kind of batch of enrollment and re registration enrollment will have taken place. Um, 
we'd like to offer an ADA update because at that point the prioritization will be done. Um, I'm going to leave capital as a placeholder given that it's such yep. a big topic and JCPC's work will probably likely be done at that point. Um, and it's a community. We've talked about capital, you know, frankly, all year long. It seems like that would be an important thing to uh, keep on there. And that's where I am so far. I would also like to request um, that we just get a, an update on the facilities, um, just you know maintenance and all those issues, because it was such a big topic last fall, and we haven't heard anything in a while from that. If that's okay with you, Dr. Morris. Okay, great. Um, sounds like a full agenda, Mr. Dumling. And just logistically, so at, we'll probably have to have another one of those short before the regional Amherst only meetings after. Uh, next Tuesday, but before the 12th, right, to approve the minutes of the vote from next oh, yeah. Tuesday, is that correct? So this is a question, uh, do we need to approve the minutes prior to the submission of the, the SOIs? Dr. Morris? Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> so I can check whether draft minutes um, are acceptable to the MSBA. I'm trying to think back. The other thing that people have done in... Yeah, I think they're acceptable. The other thing I know some communities do, which would be a change in practice here, perhaps, is that um, that part of the meeting, um, the minutes are drawn very quickly for the statement of interest, and actually the last agenda item at the meeting is to approve the minutes of the meeting that has previously occurred, because there's not likely to be mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of dialogue in that. So it's just another way to perhaps prevent people from having to come back another time. Ms. Westmoreland, I'm looking at you. Are you game for that? <laughs> 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 the furiously fast typing that, that <laughs> normally takes place. Mr. Nakajima. Do you literally mean that at, let's say, 545 in the evening, we would have uh, a meeting only of Amherst only, and then at 930 in the evening when we're done with the region, We'd, re we'd have another posted meeting of Amherst that would come together and approve those minutes? Or is that not what you mean? That is exactly what I mean, yes. Yeah, it's, okay. other communities have done it. Um, <laughs> we don't need to, but it's, I, I think I wouldn't suggest it if, it if I anticipated lots of dialogue at the meeting, but you know, the edits that were suggested last night, frankly, are strengthening in nature. I don't think there'll be a tremendous amount of dialogue about How about that. we just uh, look into whether or not the draft minutes would be accepted, and then we'll hold that in our back pockets just in case. <laughs> okay. Uh, if there are no further comments or questions from the committee for the planning, uh, I will take a motion. I move to adjourn. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? All right. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.